Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by gifts from Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Hartwig family, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly. And our topics this week, Mayor James weighs in, Eddie Bauer moves out, and there's movement on school finance in Kansas. Plus, of course, roast and toast. But we start with our newsmaker segment and talk about school finance and other issues that confront the Kansas legislature. Joining me is State Representative Stephanie Clayton, a Johnson County Republican who was first elected in 2012. She represents the 19th District, which is in Overland Park. Representative Clayton, thank you for coming in and welcome to Ruckus. Thank you for having me. So the $80 million mistake notwithstanding, uh, which we'll talk about in a moment, are you happy overall with the way the state finance legislation turned out? Not entirely. I think that we could have done better. There are some amendments that uh, were proposed on the House floor that I supported that ultimately did not make it onto the bill, which is a bit of a shame because oftentimes uh, when I look at a bill that comes out of committee, I think just like any other legislator, ooh, how can we make this better? So uh, I am overall happier with w the plan that emerged from the House as opposed to the one that emerged from the Senate. So I was pleased to see the House plan pass, but I still think that in uh, some ways it falls short. So I'm sort of waiting with bated breath to see how it's reviewed. All right, the amount was something like $534 million, I believe. Yes. Uh, and after the passage of the bill, it was revealed that there was an $80 million error and uh, that would be involving funds distributed the first year of the five-year plan. So I gather you're going back to vote again on this same legislation. Uh, yes, we are. So we're voting to correct that error. Uh, there, it's fairly significant, and it does affect some local Johnson County school districts, so it was uh, fairly concerning to a lot of us. There, there's some speculation that there are members of the state Senate, Republicans, who weren't happy with this in the first place, and finally gave up and voted for it at the last minute who might reconsider their votes. Have you heard any talk about that? Given the behavior of the Senate last Saturday <laughs> night, such a move would not surprise me. It would be disappointing, though. One of the biggest problems with this is that this is work that we should have had done per the AG's request on March 1st. It is, what day is it, April 12th? And our deadline is April 30th. We do not reconvene for our uh, wrap-up session until April 26th. So you can see that time is of the essence. And so at this point, I hope that we just pass something quickly and get something onto the courts for their review. Well, uh, regardless of what happens in the legislature, if that measure is passed, it goes to the state Supreme Court. Are you optimistic the court will say this time the funding is sufficient? I can say that I have a cautious degree of optimism and that that optimism is fairly low, but it's not completely absent. How, how about the school districts that are involved in the litigation, including the one in Kansas City, Kansas? Do you think they'll be satisfied? That remains to be seen, and so that is for them to determine. That's not for me to determine. Uh, the new governor of Kansas, uh, Jeff Collier, says the state will have enough money to finance this additional financing for the school districts without a tax increase. Do you think that's right? Yes, I've, I've reviewed the numbers and looked at the plan, and yes, if we do the five-year phase in, as the plan indicates, then we should be fine. How do you think Collier is doing? He's been the governor since uh, Governor Brownback uh, retired, resigned to take a job with the federal government. Uh, how do you think Governor Collier is doing? I think that his manner of governing is calm and ha, from a state legislative standpoint, it's kind of nice to just uh, forget that the governor is there. And so uh, Governor Brownback never really let us forget that he was on the second floor as he was always uh, tended to clash against the legislature in particular in the past two years. And so oftentimes I forget that Governor Collier is there. And so that uh, from a legislative standpoint, that pleases You're me. You're a Republican. Have you given any thought at this point to which Republican gubernatorial candidates you'll support? No, I have not. 
All right. Uh, let me ask you a couple other questions. Uh, you are known, I think, as a moderate Republican. Is that fair to say? Yes, it is. How would you distinguish uh, principally the difference between a moderate Republican in the Kansas House and a conservative Republican in the House? Well, I think one of the main differences between a moderate Republican and a conservative Republican is that a moderate Republican tends to run on a very, very education-focused basis, where we are looking at sustaining and possibly possibly even growing public education because we recognize it as the number one, uh, you know, sort of economic development tool that Kansas has to offer. Whereas conservatives tend to look at the opportunity of shrinking government and they see public education as government schools. And so they look to shrink that. And education is the biggest item in the uh, state's budget. Yes, it is for a good reason, because it's <laughs> worth spending the money on. Indeed. Uh, you're running for re-election. Yes, I am. All right. Good luck in the campaign. Thank you very much for coming in. A pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much. That is Kansas State Representative Stephanie Clayton from Johnson County. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. Patrick Tui is Director of Municipal Policy at the Show Me Institute, a free market think tank. Gwen Grant is President and CEO of the Urban League in Kansas City. John Stevens heads Rock Hill Strategic. And Annie Presley is an author, publisher, and political fundraiser. Welcome to all of you. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Kansas <laughs> legislators knew at the outset what the outcome would be. The state Supreme Court would get the final word on how much more money schools receive. Despite that, many Republicans fought to ignore the court's earlier rulings, but ultimately failed. In the wee small hours of last Sunday morning, the state Senate finally signed on to a House bill funneling half a billion dollars more into Kansas school finance. Governor Jeff Collier says the state will find the money. I expect that we'll be signing this. We've been supportive of this. This is a good compromise. As the Kansas economy grows, I think we can accommodate it. But the budgets will be tight. And now the court will decide if $534 million more is enough to satisfy the Constitution's demand for suitable provision of money for education. So, Patrick, how do you think the court's going to react to this? I don't know that anybody has any idea. The Supreme Court so far has, uh, has just demanded more at every turn, and I think what I can predict is regardless of how much more money Kansas spends on education, outcomes, scores will not improve. Why do you say that? Because we spend so much money, for example, in Kansas City, Missouri, more than the average statewide, and we don't have better outcomes. Uh, proponents of more spending seem to think that more money equals better education, and around the country we can see that just isn't the case. John, you're involved with Kansas City, Kansas, Wyandotte County, where I think two of the four school districts are located involved in this lawsuit. Right the KCK district and the Turner School District. How do you think they're going to respond to this $534 million more? Well, I, I think rightfully they're going to they're going to question the five-year implementation of it. They're going to question the the uh, what is the true legitimate increase uh, versus the uh, the interest and in, and in, in the the, the uh, growth you know the inflation rate of that. I, I think there's some legitimate questions that they're going to have beyond just the total number. But how is this really being implemented? And what is the real increase per student and what is the increase for the variables uh, of the uh, former formula and how does it really impact outcomes for the students in their district? You know, there was some talk during the last few minutes of the <clears throat> legislative session about passing a constitutional amendment within the two branches of the uh, state legislature and then submitting it to voters and uh, that went nowhere as we suspected it would not. Uh, but, but you were mentioning, I think, Gwen, as we were talking before the program, that it is hard to understand what exactly makes sufficient provision for education means. Yeah, it's pretty vague. It's very difficult for the legislature to come back with the number not knowing exactly what the Supreme Court expects. I think, though, I, I somewhat agree with Patrick uh, with regard to the money. I think the key in determining how much it costs to educate children is to look and and to align that with outcomes you have to look at it in an equitable manner you have to look at it uh, in the context of what you're going to be doing with that money and how you apply it but to just lump it and say that 
well, spending more money doesn't get the outcomes. It's much more complex than that, Patrick. You have to look at, at how uh, institutions operate and mm -hmm. what challenges they have to deal with uh, as they impart education in, uh, especially in urban school districts. So mm -hmm. to say that one size fits all is inappropriate, but the court system needs to come up with some type of a formula that state that the legislature can use to calculate what is sufficient. In, I think it, Gwen's exactly right. Uh, education uh, in urban areas especially with generations of poverty or poor education scores are uh, it's a very difficult thing to do, but in Kansas, it seems we're looking at it just by dollars spent and graduation rates, and those are meaningless. Annie, do you find it interesting that after all the complaints about spending $500 million more in the past several weeks uh, preceding this uh, vote, that now the governor says well, that's no problem, the state can afford that? Okay, that's Without a tax increase. That's pretty astonishing. <laughs> I mean, I'm not even sure where he thinks that money's coming from. It is over five years, like you said, mm -hmm. but the question is, given the the last few years of ratcheting down taxes, it's it's not real clear where it's actually going to come Well, from. you recall income taxes were raised <laughs> this year, 2017, right. and thus far these monthly reports indicate the state is collecting more revenue than anticipated. Is that not true? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, revenues revenues are up with the, with the, uh, the restoring of that of that tax cut and uh, the, some of the commodity trades, some of the other costs and, and taxes are, are rising. But over five years, who can project what if that is going to, to stabilize or grow or, or stay? I think it's a big risk. Uh, Patrick, final question. Uh, there will be a vote toward the end of the month in the state legislature apparently to redo the bill. Do you think those people who were against it but finally said, I'm going to vote for it, it's the last minute, I guess I have to, that they will say, there's nothing more I can do, vote again and we'll get that bill passed? I, I have no idea how they <laughs> wrestle with this because they're staring down the barrel. If, yeah. if, even if they resolve this now, there's absolutely no reason why school districts wouldn't come back in five, ten years and say more still because they have every incentive. There's no reason for them not to sue and ask for more money. All right, we'll move on. We always introduce ruckus, as you know, by noting that we talk about not just the news of the day, but also the trends of the times. Well, one trend that some see as alarming is the number of businesses departing the Country Club Plaza. The most recent to announce plans is Eddie Bauer closing its plaza location on May the 2nd. Eddie Bauer has been a plaza fixture since 1992. Of course, stores come and go, but the plaza has remained the city's crown jewel. Is that any in danger of changing? Well, I think the plaza is competing with everybody else in the entertainment business. Basically, they are trying to bring variety and a uniqueness to the plaza, which has been successful for many, many years. There's a lot of shuffling going on around on the plaza. Businesses are moving to other sites and they're growing and we're seeing a lot more boutique stores now, which I think is very, very healthy. So. I, the plaza to me is still in pretty good shape. I think what they do need to focus on is the lack of parking or the difficulty in parking. And also these kids who go down on the weekends and don't shop and they tend to interfere with the shoppers. Something's got to be done about that over the summer months. John, you manage the power and light district mm -hmm. for a while. Uh, what's your assessment of how things are going on the plaza? You know, every, every retail, uh, uh, every commercial area is, is changing. Uh, we were over retailed as a nation. Uh, by multipliers. Um, so, so certainly as, as retailers change, as companies change, as, as developments change, there's, they're going to have to adapt. And I think they're doing a, a, doing a job. They're trying to adapt. We have to get to smaller footprints of retail stores. I think you're going to see a lot more of the online retailers change to bricks and mortar. I think they stand as good of a chance as any uh, entertainment retail district in the metro area of being uh, of staying as the premier one. All right, I'm going to cut this short, even though it's an important yeah. topic, to get to uh, Governor Greitens. Uh, a lot has oh, happened boy. since yeah. we prepared the program, so Ooh. let me try to do a quick summary as I understand it. <laughs> a Missouri House committee is hearing testimony and allegations of misconduct against Governor Greitens who is, in addition to that, charged with invasion of privacy, felony invasion. His trial begins next month in St. Louis. The woman in the case, identified publicly only as K.S., has testified to the House Committee that some of her sexual encounters with the governor were non-consensual. She also said the governor, who was not governor then, hit her on at least three occasions. 
and the committee says her testimony is credible. Mm -hmm. The governor has refused to testify thus far before the committee. He denies the allegations, calls the investigation a witch hunt. So Patrick, uh, does this lead to impeachment of the governor? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. It's an ugly story. It's unpleasant, but I have no special information other than what's been released publicly and, uh, and no, uh, no opinion to offer. Uh, Gwen, what do you think? Does this lead to impeachment? Well, it should lead to impeachment, mm -hmm. and I really am wondering why assault charges were not filed in this case when you read yeah. the, the transcript. I mean, it's really quite alarming, and even more of concern, and actually, I'm uh, flabbergasted by the governor's stance and his doubling down on these things. What happens to these people? I mean, is it a power? Uh, something takes over your brain and your ability to reason, so you double down when you're just flat out caught wrong? I don't, under, I don't get it. Annie, Do this has understand? generated a lot of <laughs> national attention. This is almost a lead story on major network television newscast. Uh, this is not something that is going to be ignored, is it? No, and he's already re resigned from the RGA, Congressman mm -hmm. Hartzler. Republican said, Governors Association. Exactly, and um, go uh, Congresswoman Hartzler came after him and asked for him to resign, as did Attorney General Hawley. I think we've got... Uh, both of those people are Republicans, I should and add. In, and in Missouri, so they're kind of the last ones to get on board. I, I think nationally it's part of our hashtag MeToo issue. And certainly, we need to just be aware of the fact that this guy's supposed to be running our $27.5 billion state, and it's just a little bit of a distraction. Yeah, it, it, it's, it stopped everything. And, and I think it is important to, to, to recognize that this is not a partisan call mm -hmm. for him. This, this, the, the, the committee uh, was five Republicans and two Democrats right. on that committee that issued that, that, that report. So, and, and a lot of elected officials who are Republican, as Annie was pointing out, have come out absolutely. in opposition absolutely. to Brighton's and calling either for his impeachment yeah. or his resignation. It does not appear, does it, Gwen, that he's about to resign? No, I mean he should, though. <laughs> I mean, his, would, would he be better family. off to just? Would he be better off yes. than just to sit down? Yes, oh, take the high road, yeah. sit your behind down, and respect <laughs> your family and your children. I mean, seriously. Yeah, this has got to be a, a major embarrassment for Mrs. Greitens. Absolutely. Uh, and, and absolutely. They have one child, I think, or is it two? Is it anyway, one? The she child was, is probably she was with child too young when to all be of this aware, took yeah. place. So. But uh, should point out, although it won't make any difference in the outcome, that all of these allegations against Greitens occurred before he ran for governor and certainly before he was elected governor of Missouri. Yes. And when he came in, people thought he was going to have a bright future, and there mm -hmm. was talk yeah. about someday a president Greitens, perhaps, that he would might seek that office, but mm -hmm. I think it's probably uh, fair to say that's no longer a likelihood. And he had a, pla you know, he ran on a platform of family values. Well, you guys did great <laughs> on a topic that we didn't expect to talk about. <laughs> uh, we'll probably do more on this next week, and of course, uh, Nick Haynes and Kansas City Week in Review will have plenty of time to get ready to talk about this. Friday evening at 7.30 here on KCPT. A question about the propriety of renaming Paseo to honor civil rights leader Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. came from a most unlikely source, the African-American mayor of Kansas City, Sly James. The mayor says there are more meaningful ways to pay tribute. James has appointed an 11-member advisory group to recommend the best way to honor King that, and I quote, aligns with the city's long-term planning goals and vision for an inclusive community. Meantime, the SCLC continues its petition drive to get the renaming of Paseo on the August ballot. Among those leading the drive for a name change is former mayor and now Congressman Emmanuel Cleaver. So Gwen, how is all of this likely to get resolved? Well, certainly the SCLC and, and uh, ministers who have been working on this issue for many, many years, certainly uh, Congressman Cleaver has been an advocate for this name change for uh, quite a long time, uh, they will get the signatures and it, there will be a ballot initiative and uh, then the community will have the opportunity to vote this issue up or down. Now, appointing a commission to uh, provide a decision or some recommendations in, the, in 45 days about how 
to honor uh, Dr. King. So I see that as a both and strategy. I mean, there's mm -hmm. nothing about the commission being appointed that would negate the opportunity to rename Paseo, which is a boulevard, which makes a lot of sense because as a boulevard, it would be maintained by the park department. When you look at the 900 other streets across the country that have been named after Dr. King, they have not been maintained in a manner that would honor truly Dr. King's legacy. So therefore, I think, uh, you know, why staying pat, staying strong for Paseo Boulevard as opposed to what is not necessarily a bad uh, concept to explore of an east-west mm -hmm. uh, street, but there are no east-west boundaries that I think would would um, apply that would, I mean, east-west boulevards that uh, we, a boulevard is really important. And uh, Paseo is a lovely thoroughfare. Um, it has been maintained well, they, so I, and it runs through the African American community, but it also, you know, running north and south. I think it's a good, it's a good choice. Let me ask you first, and I'll ask some of the other folks. Uh, were you surprised that Mayor James wasn't wholeheartedly behind this? No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, there's a, can you explain a no, little more? I'm, no. I'm going to do as Congressman Cleaver. And there's a sticky wicket here, though. Criticism. You, you can do a uh, Patrick. I have no views on that. Here's, yeah, I have I have no no views. Thoughts about it. Here's what you know: uh, 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 a, a, a in-show toast to Nick Haynes and Dia Wall at uh, KSHB for doing a great piece on the 50-year anniversary right. of the '68 mm -hmm. yeah. riots. Nice. And and in that piece, if you watch it, it talked about the mayor's report at the time about the things they wanted to do to increase mm -hmm. equality. None, none of those goals have been met 50 years later, and I am frustrated, frankly, that when we talk about this issue, it's in terms of naming boulevards mm -hmm. or renaming fountains. Kansas City, we, the, the panel had two former mayors mm -hmm. who acted as if they weren't in charge of the city. Yeah, for one, a combined, current, one current right, mayor and one former mayor. Acted as if they had nothing to do with 16 years of this city's history. We have real problems. We have economic development policy, which is the grandchild of, of redlining, and yet we seem to be satisfied with naming streets and fountains and, oh, and not to no, take come anything on. No. satisfied Patrick I think that's a stretch. I would rather I have a conversation no. about but economic we development have had, policy. But we do have conversations about economic development policy. We do challenge the city to uh, make equitable allocations in the urban it, core. We recently passed a, a, an eight cents uh, sales tax to address the uh, the uh, disparities that is that exist uh, in the prospect quarter. Those so are things better, th are happening. This is an issue simply that is timely in the right. uh, it's in this in or. this moment mm -hmm. of I don't honoring have a Dr. King, it's I don't not have a an either it. or. But the way that you're framing it would would I, imply that, that, that we're not working. I too am frustrated about the lack of progress, but this issue should not be conflated with that one. Can I move to the other side of the table? Please do. Oh, okay. Uh, John, should there be multiple uh, facilities that have the King name? Well, certainly. Uh, uh, Dr. King. Dr. King has played such a crucial role. In, in, in our community, in the national conversation, and in the global conversation, and continues to be someone that should be honored. I, I, I go back to, I, I do think that both of, these, both of these discussions as it pertains to honoring Dr. King and others should go through both processes. I think the petition process is fantastic for this. I also think that Mayor James con convening a group of leaders to have discussions about more is important. And, and I also very much agree that the other 90% of the conversation should continue to be about real equality and real investment in the community that, that has positive outcomes for generations. And unfortunately, we don't have any more time. I wanted to talk about the move by the SCLC and NAACP mm -hmm. to uh, take a move and try to get the police department under city, mm -hmm. not state yes. control. Yes, yes. That will Again. be That's good. fascinating to watch. That's great. All right, it is time now to head to the soapbox for roast and toast where the Ruckheads have 30 seconds each to inculcate or extirpate as they discuss people and events <laughs> in the news. And let's start with Patrick and see if he has anything to say. Kansas City's own Bill Sapphire, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, a roast to Kansas City city leaders for opposing a measure in Jeff City that would cap the sales tax rate in Kansas City and around the, the, the state at 14%. They argue that 14% sales tax isn't high enough. You have to wonder what they have in mind for us. All right, uh, John. Sure. I'd like to give a toast to the 
often frequently maligned Kansas City Star. You know, with, with declining uh, number of reporters, uh, the post-it note size weekday print edition, and all the other challenges that they face, I, I, I have to say there is a core, especially over the last two to three weeks of an intense news cycle, there are a lot of great reporters doing some really fantastic reporting on the issues that matter in Kansas City. So a toast to the Kansas City Star reporters for doing a fantastic job in challenging circumstances. Gwen? I'd like to roast third district councilman Jermaine Reed for sponsoring and the other nine council members who voted with him an ordinance that stripped churches and schools in the 18th and Vine district of their power to veto a liquor license for any business within 300 feet of their, of their doors. The ordinance targets only the 18th and Vine district while allowing Zona Rosa, the plaza, and Westport to retain their veto power. The power of church Churches and schools to determine or to weigh in on what types of businesses locate in close proximity to their operations should remain sacrosanct. Shame on you, Councilman Reed, and hopefully the third district electric will hold you accountable. Ms. Presley? I am toasting Paul Ryan. He's given 20 years to the United States Congress and um, finally realized, with some good advice from a Springfieldian, that it's time to go home and raise his family. And uh, he tried to turn the Titanic, didn't quite get it done. All right, and finally, here's a quick toast to presidential historian Doris Kearns Goodwin. In a discussion about social media on Meet the Press, she reminded viewers to be cautious when writing or doing anything online. She passed along some advice she got early in her career. Never write when you can speak and never speak when you can nod. Do you all agree with that? No, okay. And that is Ruckus for this week. We're back next Thursday at 7. Now for the Ruckus and the crew, I'm Mike Shannon saying thanks very much for watching and good night.